Sunday night. I'm quite encouraged. And in the balcony as well. I looked around for your student pastor and, and I couldn't find him this morning. He says he was upstairs, but I'm not sure he came to church. I just want to tell you the truth about that. You might want to speak to him about it. If you have your device with you and you have Facebook on that device, why don't you go ahead right now and share this meeting with someone. Uh, somebody may come tomorrow night or the next night. If you have that and you'd like to do it, pull it out real quick while I'm telling an opening story and do what I did a few minutes ago. I went to the Hillsborough Bible Baptist Church page and I shared that deal and I've already got a few folks that are taking a look tonight and I think it'd be good to invest that in them. Some are at home tonight and, uh, and maybe they'll watch and others will possibly come and gather with us a little later in the week. As you're turning to Exodus 33, let me tell you about two of my youngest grandsons. Terry and I have six grandchildren. I may throw a picture up one night just to uh, show you uh, all six of them. Uh, they range in age from uh, four years old to 15 years old. And our two youngest, Justice and Thomas, are four years of age and six years of age. This past week, we decided we would pick them up from school before we left for our trip because we don't like to be gone this many days without seeing those boys. And so can you imagine what it was like when we walked to the back door of the Wayne Avenue School where Justice goes? He's, a, he's on the autism spectrum and he'd been in there all day long with his teacher and he's used to opening the door and seeing his mama standing there but instead he saw his grandmother and his granddaddy standing there and can I tell you there was sheer joy on his face and that kid comes running out screaming granddaddy, granddaddy, grandmama and there he comes running out the door. We go over to just across the field. You could actually, uh, about as long as your parking lot, you could go across to this little school brook side Christian Academy where our grandson Thomas is in school as a first grader Terry he's a first grader and we pull over there and we walk around in the park a little bit until it's time for him to come out same scene sheer joy and they are pumped to see grandmother and granddaddy I want to ask you a question I want to ask you how excited you are when you get to see Jesus face to face and I'm not just talking about when we meet him one day on the other side I'm talking about what do, you, what, do you, what do you look like and what do you act like when you come into his presence in a public gathering or in those private times, just you and him in the morning or in the evening when you gather with him. Someone has said we have lost the astonishment of the presence of God. We're going through the motions, but we've lost the amazement and the awe, A-W-E, the awe and wonder of God. That's why I love songs, Jeff, like that one. I like all the songs we're doing, glory to glory. I mean, I'm all about that, but I'm telling you that we believe stuff just talked about God the Father. Did you see that? He's talking about my father right there. I want to be as excited about that as he was when Thomas come out that school door, or Justice did. And he's talking about Jesus, my elder brother. My Savior, I, I'm telling you, we just sit here like, well, good, I'm glad he came. He died on the cross for us. And then the Holy Ghost, he's talking about G, talking about the Holy Spirit and, and all the good stuff about that. Look, somebody ought to be happy about that. If you agree with it, say amen. amen. Now look, he did, he did, God did before the foundation of the world in Christ. He looked down through time and saw you in the mess you were in. He also saw the mess you'd be even after he saved you. And he still redeemed you. And that merits some joy and some passion on the part of God's people. Well, revival's about that. And the glory of God, the, the presence of God, the uh, manifested presence of God is what we're going to talk about tonight. And uh, so I want us to look back to Exodus 33. And we're going to pick up where we left off just a little bit. And I saw something. 
Um, I hope everybody was here this morning. If not, you can go back and look at the live stream or the, the stream from this morning. And we talked a little bit about de just deciding and the glory of God being something you desire. Now let me tell you, by your coming tonight and being here, and some of you who are here early and you're fellowshipping, and this is a really good uh, Sunday evening number, you said boldly, I have decided I'm going to obey the counsel of my pastor and I'm going to seek the glory. I desire to see God's presence in a new and real and very clear way. I want to be in the glory of God. I want to see His glory and experience His glory. That's what you said by coming back. Now, now I, I'm not going to chide with those that couldn't. Some people may have been providentially hindered. But I'm telling you something. If anything becomes more important to me than the presence of God, then something is dead wrong. And so I, I congratulate you and celebrate that uh, with you tonight, that that's your desire. Today, not only the glory desired this morning, but tonight I want to preach for a few minutes on this subject, the glory displayed. And I'm going to use the text that we saw in the video. In just a few moments, we'll go to 2 Corinthians. But I want you to look with me. After uh, the Bible says in verse 11, we closed here, And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp, but his servant Joshua, there's the young man, the son of Nun, a young man departed not out of the tabernacle. Now look at verse 12. And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, Lord, I know thee by name. And thou hast also found that, that, and that and thou hast found, also found grace in my sight. You've told me, Lord, that you know me. You've told me I've found grace in your sight. Now therefore, verse 13, I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, I saw three things here. Look at number one. Show me now thy way. This is another way of saying, God, show me your glory. We're going to see that in just a moment. But I want you to, if you're marking your Bible, mark or I, I circle the word me. Show me thy way. This is where it all starts. Before God shows it to your family, before God shows it to your community, before God shows it in the church, before He reveals His presence, it starts with a personal decision on your part. Did you know if nobody else in your church experiences revival this week, you can. I was sitting, there may be a boy here right now, I was sitting as, a, as a, just a young man, uh, the Lord called me to preach, in 1972, uh, I was 12 years old. I was sitting in a service, and I got in on the glory in that moment. I, God came to me and spoke very clearly to my soul and revealed himself to me the night that I, that I responded to him. I don't know how many other people God spoke to that night. It didn't matter. It was a matter of me and him. He had something to say to me. I wanted to hear it. I was seeking the glory, his presence, I was interested in that. I was desiring what God had to say to me as a young man and God called me after he saved me just a little while before that. Show me now thy way. And here it is. Look at this. That I may know thee. Now you're not asking for God to reveal himself and show his glory so that you can experience some kind of emotional uh, <clears throat> jolt so that you can say I'm more spiritual than someone else. Oh no. We are seeking the glory of God for him, every part of this, we're going to see it wrapped up in a moment in the text and so many other places. The glory, the manifested glory of God was always for him. We just want to be around it. We just want to see it. We want to be near him in it. But it all starts with a personal decision. Lord, show me thy glory. Now stop and don't think about anybody else. Don't think about your wife. Don't think about your husband or your kids and how much they need it. Don't think about that family that used to come to your church and now they're no longer worshiping God. And, and don't think about any of that. Think about you. Revival is about you. Being real comes to you. Number one, show me now thy way that I might know thee and that I might find grace in thy sight and consider that this nation is thy people. Look at next, verse 14. And he said, listen to what God said. Now remember, look back up to chapter 33 and verse 3. He said, I will not go up in the midst of thee. Chapter 33, verse 3. I will not go up in the midst of thee. Now, let's 
let's compare that to verse 14. Exodus 33, 14. And he, God said, my presence shall go with thee and I will give thee rest. What made the difference? Moses cried out to God. It was then the plan of God and, it, and Moses cried out to God, Lord, don't do it, don't take them out. If so, blot my name out. Remember that from this morning? Moses stood between him, between God and between that rebellious nation. And you know, you're, some of you are thinking about somebody you love and care about and they're not saved or they're away from God. Hey, there are going to be some time. We're going to visit that this week. But right now, it's not time to think about them. It's time to think about you. It's time for us to get ourselves completely and absolutely real. We talked about honesty this morning. I'm going to ask you another thing tonight. Tonight, I want you to talk to God while I'm preaching too, and I want you to say this to Him if you mean it. Lord, not only am I going to get honest with you, I, I'm going to be honest with you this week. I'm going to also be humble before you. If you ask me to do something, Lord, I'm going to do it. If you ask me to be a part of something, I'm going to be a part of it. I'm going to humble myself before you. In other words, I'm not going to have my way. I'm going to let you have your way. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and He will exalt you in due season. Let me tell you something. Pride is killing our Baptist churches. I'm going to say that one more time. Pride is killing our Baptist churches. We somehow believe since we're saved and we towed a Bible that we are exempt from sin. Listen to me. I don't care who you are or how long you've been saved or how long you've been in this church. I know something about you. You're a mess. Your mess may be different than my mess or somebody sitting on that same row with you. But you still are a sinner. You're a saved sinner. You're going to heaven, but you're still a mess. You're not completely sanctified. Have you ever met anybody that thought they never made any mistakes? Don't you want to slap those people? Because you know better than that. Boy, I've met these people. I see them all the time. They're so pious. And they carry themselves as if to say, Well, I, Brother Wagner, I have been a Christian for many years. In fact, my mother gave the land for this building here. I'm the chairman of the board of this and that. And while they're talking, I'm like Charlie Brown's mother. You know, you ever heard her? She goes, wah, 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 wah. That's all I'm hearing. And what I'm hearing is, I am full of pride, Brother Wagner. They're not saying that, but that's what I'm hearing. Look here, let's not strut our stuff this week. You know what one of the preacher friends I have, Junior Hill, says about this? He says some preachers, Brother Dan, are so full of pride they can strut sitting down. I think he's right about that. I, I've met those men. <laughs> Listen to me, church. I'm asking you to say to God, Lord, I want to be humble. I want you to humble me this week. I want the humility that I have been told that I have. Do you know what the Bible says about you? You have the mind of Christ. Did you know that? Somebody don't need, some folks don't know that. You have it. Now, you may not be using it. The Bible says, but ye have the mind of Christ. Well, what is the mind of Christ? It's humility. Well, how do you know that? Because the Bible... You know what Philippians chapter 2 says? Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, listen to this, made it not robber to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, mind of Christ, took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, say the next part with me, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God, listen to what happens when you humble yourself. Wherefore God then highly exalted him and gave him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Where did all that start? It started with a humble Savior leaving heaven and coming to the earth to humble himself and go to the cross for me. If Jesus went to the cross and humbled himself, when I humble myself, I'm being like Jesus. And when you humble yourself, you're being like who? Jesus. Lord, I'm asking you to humble me this week. I pray through this building there'll be the saints crying out to you, Lord, make us humble. Make us honest. Make us humble. Now back to our text. Show me now thy way. Verse 14, he said unto and he said, my presence shall go with thee. I can almost see him smiling when he said that. Oh, good. And I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, 
Listen to this. If thy presence go not with me, there's another word here, carry us not up hence. If you're underlining or circling anything in your Bible, you just circle me. He said, show me now. Now he says, carry us not up hence. Lord, if you're not going, I don't want to go. I heard somebody ask this question the other day. I thought it was a really good question. If you could go to heaven with the streets of gold and the gates of pearl, mansions bright, and all your loved ones are there, but Jesus is not going to be there, would you still want to go? Now don't answer that. Just think about it a minute. You see, we've been, we live in prosperous America. We need to travel outside this country some. Because we've got so much. It's like we got money. And we got buildings and we got people. We don't need God. We're, we're very content doing business as usual, going through the motions. How tragic. Let me tell you, if he ain't going to be there, I don't want to go. I don't want my heart set on a nice fancy, I can go do that on vacation right now for a few days. But if I'm going somewhere for eternity, I want to go where he is. If you do, will you say amen and just be honest about it? I'm talking about honesty and humility. Now he said, show me, show us, look at this, for wherein shall it be known, verse 16, here that I and thy people, oh Moses is smart, he's reminding God who they are, he said, Lord I'm going to tell you, these ain't my people, they're yours. They, Lord, wherein shall it be known, how are they going to know that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not that thou goest with us, so shall we be separated? Now watch this. I and the people, I and thy people from, say the next three words with me, all the people that are upon the face of the earth. You know what I wrote underneath that, and I circled it? I wrote them. Show me, show us, and then how you think he's going to show all the other people in the earth? Them. It starts with me. Lord, show me your glory. And then show us in the church your glory. And then show them outside the church. Sh show our community. Uh, Pastor, have you seen this happen? Well, it happened not long ago in this state. Not too awfully far from here. God started stirring some people in a church. As a matter of fact, it started at camp. Fuel camp, as a matter of fact. A few young people got right with God, came back, and started getting, uh, praying and seeking God for their school. And the next thing you know, there's a fire burning in the school and every kid from the whole girls' volleyball team, senior high, were sitting in the same church every single Sunday. Does that shock you? That county started to be made very aware that God was at work. It actually, a, a tragedy occurred a little later where someone that had coached them had passed away. God will do whatever he has to do. Hey, listen to this. The Bible says God will share his glory with no man. This is the glory of God, the manifested presence of God. He's to be glorified. We're to enjoy the blessings of it. But it started with an individual, show me thy glory, and then show us thy glory as a group, and then show them thy glory. Wouldn't it be something if God did something in you that would produce something in your student ministry or in your church, and then do something that would communicate something powerful in the church? Do you know it's hard for us even to believe that? Things have gotten so dry and cold and we've gotten to the place where we almost can't even imagine seeing that. But I want to tell you something. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God has the power to bring that to pass. Do you believe that? It's not about whether or not He can. We know He can. It's whether or not we're going to be willing to be humble and honest and repent. And then God's turned loose to do whatever he wants to do. I love what happens next. Look at verse 17. And the Lord said unto Moses, look at this, Brother Dan, I will do this thing. <laughs> oh, I love that right there. I just underlined that in my Bible. I, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. Moses, I know who you are. Can I shock you? What is it, almost 7 billion people on the planet right now? Did you know the Lord knows your name? Now look here. He knows everything about you. He loves you. He knows how many hairs are on your head. 
Listen to me. You're the apple of his eye. You're the object of his affection. Every now and then somebody says to me, I don't think anybody loves me. Martyrs, you know martyrs are in the Baptist church. You got them here. Nobody cares about me. Nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. I think I'll eat some worms. I mean, that's the way they, they live their life, Pastor. I want to tell you something right now. These folks haven't read their Bibles. You have someone sitting in the heavens that adores you. He delights in you, the Bible says. With all that in mind, God said, I know your name and I'm going to do what you've asked me to do. I'm going to show you and then I'm going to show us and then I'm going to show them. Look at this. And he said, I beseech thee. He just keeps on asking even though God says he's going to do it. Look at Moses. He's, he's on to this thing. He's like us. He's hanging on to this glory truth. Lord, I want to see you. I want to experience your presence. Verse 18. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Now you know what happens next. I won't take time to preach it. And the Lord said, I'll tell you what you do. You go up there, turn with me over to, uh, to our text, which is uh, 2 Corinthians 3, our key verse. He said, I want you to go up there in that cliff, get back in there, because you can't see me and live. It's impossible. And so you, you can't, I'm so, I'm so great, I'm so bright. You, your human body could not handle it. But I want to tell you what I want you to do. I want you to go up there, and I want you to get in that cliff to that rock, and I'm going to pass by there. And all you're going to see, listen to this, is my hinder parts. <laughs> That's a little crazy right there, the way God put that. It's pretty cool, though. He said, you're going to see the hinder part. And you're just going, I'm going to put my hand out. And I'm telling you, God passed by there. You ever remember that old song we used to sing? Since Jesus passed by. Since Jesus passed by, oh, what a difference. Since Jesus passed by, well, I can't explain it, and I cannot tell you why, but oh, what a difference when Jesus passed by. I'm telling you, Moses is never going to be the same. When Jesus passes by, he's bright and glowing. He's a grinning so big, you can see every tooth in that little thing in the back of his throat. It probably uvula and everything else because he knows I've experienced something near. Listen, those moments in his glory will change us forever. And we're believing God that that'll happen in our lives this week. Oh, the glory of God. I was thinking about some glory stories. You know this church has got glory stories. You do. You got them. I want to hear some of them. I'm going to tell you a couple of mine since it's my turn to preach tonight. I've had several in my life. Um, I'll never forget the morning that when the Lord saved me. I won't tell that right now. He called me to preach at the Bill Rice Ranch. You ever heard of the Bill Rice Ranch? It's in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. John R. Rice and Bill Rice and all them Rice brothers put this big old camp together and a little old boy went there. My daddy, I was, <clears throat> I was 10 years old when my father died. My little brother was 8. It was a couple years after that. I went, we, mother married this man uh, when I, well, no, I guess I was 13 because she married um, Arthur Justice, my stepfather, all in the plan of God. Three years after my uh, father had died and they got married, he saw the church we were in was dead as a hammer, Brother uh, Dan. He got us out of there, took us to a church. He got us out of the refrigerator and stuck us into the oven and put us in a church where God was at work like this one. And they took us the next week or two. We went to camp. We had three bus loads. Ninety of us went to camp. We get in that camp at the Bill Rice Ranch and Paul Levine and some of those people started preaching. And I remember they started singing. I felt stuff I ain't never felt before in my life. I knew I was saved. But I didn't know what was about to happen. And sure enough, one night I remember sitting there and these young people heard me tell this at camp. But I remember sitting there and most of the kids in that, in our, that youth group had more money than we did. Uh, my father uh, died, drank himself to death. and We lived real simple in a little meal house. And I remember looking down the aisle at those other kids and they all had nice. The big deal back then was the Chuck Taylors. You ever remember those Chuck Taylor? The kids are wearing them again now, I understand. Chuck Taylor, Converse shoes. Well, I didn't have Chuck Taylors. You know what I had? I had those ones you get to Kmart when those light, that light used to go round and round and round. You, anybody remember the blue light specials? 
Now that, that light go around and my mother was drawn to it like a moth to a flame. She thought everything that was in that light had to be bought. She's still like that. She's 92. She's still like that. She went over and bought me and my little brother a pair of those shoes. And I'm going to tell you, they don't last. You know, they don't hardly last any time. And I remember that I, I had sitting there with those shoes and my shoe had broken loose a little bit from the sole. You know how when the sole breaks loose from the, from the shoe just a little bit? And kind of, you know, it's embarrassing, number one. The rest of them all had Chuck Taylors or P.F. Flyers or one of those good shoes. And I'm sitting there with those Walmart, Kmart specials. And the, the, the thing had broke loose, Brother Dan. It was kind of, it was really sad because it was like smiling at you. And later, what happens when them shoes break loose all the way, they're not, they're not smiling, they're laughing out loud, man. I just, mine was just laughing out loud. And I remember sitting there, and I remember that preacher got up and he said, there's a young man in this room tonight. I, I, this gets real to me every time I tell it. There's somebody sitting in this room tonight, and God's calling them. I got to chill right now just thinking about this. I'm sitting at 900 people, 900 kids at that camp. I'm sitting there in the it's my glory story now, I'm telling you. And he starts talking, and I'm thinking, boy, I wish it was me. I sure wish it was me. I mean, but, but God don't call people who's had a daddy like I have and who live like we do. Surely, I don't have a gift like that. And he, but I sure wish it, God, if it could be somebody like me, and sure enough, Pastor, just as real as anything in the world, it was like the Lord slipped up beside me and whispered in my ear, it's you. You're the one I want. You're the one I've come tonight for. And it got real to me in the presence of God was right there. And I couldn't wait for him to quit preaching so I could run down that aisle and fall in that altar and tell God, Lord, if you can use a little boy like me and you've got a plan for my life, then I want to do exactly what you want me to do. And look here, I ain't been much through the years, but I'm glad for that day when God revealed himself and his glory to me on that night. But it wasn't just that night. There have been other times through the year. I remember when that three-week meeting broke out that Sunday morning at Central. It was like the Lord moved in. We saw the glory of God. And I'll never forget that morning people were getting right with God and they were going to each other. Folks were getting saved. We come back that night and I don't even remember who it was but a little old saint in our church. The same wind that was blowing in the morning was blowing that night. She stood up at the end of the service and she said, Pastor, I sense that God is at work in the church and I think we ought to meet again tomorrow night. And you can see the heads nodding like they're dogs in the back of the car they used to have back in the day. Well, you could tell we were supposed to. So we started meeting. We did that for three weeks. 35 people came to faith in Jesus. You know why? I, by the way, I call preachers, all my friends. Can you come and preach? No, nope, sorry. We're booked. We can't do it. We can't come. And every day God was giving me a little fresh manna to give the church at the night. You know why? Because God's glory and His presence was there. And when God shows up, everything changes. Amen. That's the glory we're talking about. The glory of God. I don't want to live without that. I don't want to just come to church. I don't want to just sing songs. God didn't intend for us to. Some glory, glory moments. One more real quick. A few years ago, I'll never forget, I, our music minister at that time, Joel Gross, said to me, Pastor, he said, I found a song, and it's a song about the mantle. Uh, I believe the Roops were singing it back then. And he said, I'm going to teach the choir. And they're coming up that Friday night when you preach in Asheville. He'll, he'll not Asheville, uh, Weaverville at that Monta Vista camp meeting. And on that last night, we'll bring the choir. And you're supposed to preach on Friday night. I don't know. He said, maybe the Lord, hey, God was speaking to him. Maybe the Lord will give you a little message out of that text. Elijah and Elisha. Well, I'm going to tell you that whole week it just built. The Lord was there. You could feel the presence of the Lord in that old camp meeting in those old cedar shavings all over the floor. And that last night, that choir come rolling in. And I had one of our little ladies that's a seamstress make a bunch of mantles just by faith. I didn't know what all God was going to do that night. Just little pieces of cloth with a Monte Vista on them, engraved, embroidered, not engraved, embroidered on them. That night, they started singing that song. And I'm telling you, Matt, just as sure as anything in the world, the Lord, the cloud, I didn't see a cloud, but it's, you could feel the cloud. It got sweet in there. Terry, do you remember this? 
It was so sweet. I'm telling you, it was the sweetest thing. And all of a sudden, God started to move, and I got to preaching, and I don't remember what all I said. I just remember the Lord turned me loose and let me preach that night on that text. When I got through, I felt prompted to do something I hadn't even planned to do. There was a missionary, J.T. Lyons, and his wife were in the service. I said, will y'all stand down here? There was an old preacher, Clarence Inslee, and his wife, Ruby. I said, will y'all stand here? There were others standing across, and I said, there are young people, I believe, in this room that God's calling tonight. And I want you to come and just obey God. There are others of you that the mantle that needs to fall on you from the past generation to move into the next. And all I know next that happened is the glory rolled in and the power of God fell in that camp meeting and i never seen anything quite like it. Probably 30 or more young people coming to surrender to the Lord that night. And those old folks were taking those mantles and wrapping around their neck and bowing down with them in those shavings and praying the power of God upon those young people. And many of them are still preaching and still singing and still serving uh, because God moved that night in that one of those glory moments. You got yours. You also know what it feels like when the glory of God has departed. Tomorrow night, please don't miss. Call your friends and tell them. Because I want to show you, we talked about the glory desired tonight, the glory displayed, but tomorrow night, what, what happens when the glory departs? And then we're going to take the next night and we're going to do something about taking care of that so we can have the glory dwelling with us. Someone said that the glory of God is the manifested beauty of His holiness on display. It's when He comes, He shows up, He manifests Himself. It's the, it's the infinite beauty and greatness of God's manifold perfections. It's when we get little and He gets big. When we step back and he steps up. Now our text, and I can do this real briefly. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 7, sometime in the, this week, I want you to go through and underline every time you see the word glorious or glory, or glory or glorious, every time you see it, underline it. <clears throat> The, the text starts in verses 7 through down to about verse 15, telling us the, the story of Moses when he was on the mountain receiving from God the law and how the glory was revealed in that law moment. God in all of His glory revealed as He wrote with His finger on the stone for Moses. And when Moses came down, he had a veil on his face. Remember that. Because the people couldn't stand to see it. It was so great, so bright. God is so holy. It was such a wonderful moment. But he said there's something even better than that. Look at verse 14. But their minds were blinded. Talking about the people, the Israelites. Their minds were blinded for until this day, even today still, the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament which veil is done away in Christ. Did you know a lot of your Jewish friends, Orthodox Jews, still don't see the fact that Jesus is the glory of Christ? that Jesus is the glory of God the Father, they still don't see it. They don't get it. It's like a veil. But then he said this, Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. And here's our verse. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image. Say the next part with me. From glory to glory. I want you to notice three or four things. Number one, if you're writing notes, write this down. Number one, the scope of the glory. The scope of the glory. Look at verse 18 one more time. And notice those first three words. But we all who are candidates to enjoy the glorious presence of God. We all. He didn't say all. He said we all. In other words, every blood bought, born again, saint of God, every child of God can enjoy the presence of God. If you're not enjoying the glory, then there's something blocking up, something damming up your, your stream of enjoying the glory of God. It's for everybody. It's for every child of God. We all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. The glory of God is for everybody. Everybody that's a saint there is. By the way, if you're not saved, you won't enjoy the glory of God. You won't see it. You won't get it. Your friends don't understand why you get blessed. 
when the tears began to roll sometimes when we're singing about Jesus or, or uh, sometimes someone uh, shares something about Jesus and the preacher's preaching and a tear escapes your eye or you go back to thinking about those moments when you got a glimpse of the glory of God and you get blessed, they'll look at you and think you've lost your cotton picking mind. Do y'all say that up here like that or is that just a North Carolina statement? But you know what it's like, don't you? You know those times when you're driving down and road in the car? I put the Collingsworth on today. Y'all know the Collingsworths? <clears throat> they come around our part of the country some. I play, there's a song they sing called, I Can Trust Jesus. It blesses me. I sometimes listen to it when I'm getting ready to preach. It stirs me up. I can trust Jesus. He never once has failed to meet. My need. He, listen to this part. He is my strong tower. The strength in my weakest hour. I can trust Jesus. He takes care of me. I don't know what it is that causes you to see Jesus, whatever it is that helps you get a glimpse of Him and get a look up at Him. Listen to me. In those moments, just remember, it's for you. The glory of God. He's to be glorified, but it's for us. Watch this. We all, the scope of the glory. Every child of God, every saint, all over the world, in every mission field. Number one, the scope of the glory. Number two, the secret. There's a secret. There's a mystery here. You ready for it? We all, with open face. You know what the word <clears throat> open face carries the idea of the unveiled face. But it's a different kind of veil than what Moses had on when he uh, had such glory of God on him. This is pre that. This word means unveiled or our theme is real revival. Nobody ever has revival. Nobody ever sees a glimpse of the glory until they unveil their face. And they really get honest. And they really get humble. And they reveal. They unveil their face. Listen to me. I'm sitting here preaching in this room to a good number of saints. Some of you, there's a couple boys hadn't hardly been able to look up the whole service. You know what I know about them? They ain't mean. There are folks that can't look sometimes at you when you preach. There's a look of fear and hurt and trepidation, all kinds. Listen, you know what I know? I know something. Listen to me. You've got a veiled up face. You think you're going to hide all of it and listen to me. You can hold it all for yourself or you can say to God, Lord, this week I'm going to get honest and I'm going to unveil my face. I'm, I'm tired of hiding. I'm tired of covering. I want you to see it. I don't care who else knows it. I'm going to get real with you this week, God, and I'm going to get right with you. That's the secret of the glory of God. Only those that unveil their face and get honest and get real will ever experience the glory of God and revival. Amen. But we all with open face, the scope of the glory, the secret of the glory, beholding as in a glass the scriptures, number three, the scriptures and the glory. You know, the Bible talks about the mirror, looking in the mirror of God's word. You know, I think I look pretty good till I look in that mirror. I took me a nap today, me and Terry. I got under the covers. I'm not ashamed of it. I love taking a nap on Sundays. And when I preach and give my heart on Sunday morning, if I'm going to feel like I'm going to have any juice at all in the evening, I like to get me a good nap. I mean a good one. I got a really good nap. I was already in that third stage of REM sleep, rapid eye movement. You say, how do you know that? Because I was dreaming, man. I was dreaming. Uh, and so I know I was resting good. When I got up, my hair in the back is doing some really unusual things. My wife says, your hair looks terrible. She actually called the name of a man that we love. His hair goes every which direction. And she said, you look like so-and-so. <laughs> you need to repent of that, honey, because that was, uh, that was not kind. But listen to me. When I looked in the mirror, I saw myself for just the way I am. Did you know I can believe anything I want to believe? When I look through my eyes, I think I'm still young. But when I look in the mirror of God's Word... When I look in the mirror, I see who I, that I really am older. And when I look into the mirror of God's Word, I don't see myself and judge myself by myself or by anybody else. I see myself in light of what God says about me. Amen. We all, the scope of the glory, with open face, unveiled face, honest, real, beholding as in a glass 
The glory of the Lord. Watch this. The Scriptures will reveal the glory of God. I don't have time right now because I'm hitting it another night. But listen to me. All through the Bible, you'll see glory stories. They started before the foundation of the world. In heaven, God was glorified. God was glorious. Jesus was glorious. We see the glory of God manifested in the garden. When He came and walked with Adam and Eve, we see it on the mountain. We see it in the tabernacle. We see it in the temple. We see it as the pillar of cloud led by day and the pillar of fire by night. Are you listening to me? All through the Bible we see the glory of God, but you've got to be looking for it. The Scriptures reveal God's glory. And as we look in the Scriptures, we recognize, I'm not enjoying it, Lord, the way these men enjoyed it in the Bible. I want to be near you too. Did you know he's no respecter of persons? I believe I read somewhere in here, he's the same yesterday, say the rest with me, and today, and I believe he said that. So stop making excuses. It's revival week. It's like somebody says, what's revival for, for adults? It's like camp. It's like camp. We're having an adult camp with kids and young people and we're going to have a time in the glory of God. Let me hurry. The scope of the glory we all, with open face, the secret of the glory. Get real. Beholding us in a glass, the scriptures and the glory. The glory of the Lord. Notice this, the substitution of the glory are changed. I asked the men of your church something, and I love those men because they're real honest. I said, is there anybody in this room and raise your hand and say you don't need some change? Are changed into the same image. Into what image? God's glory that I see in the Scriptures. You mean, Pastor, that I can have a, a nearness to God like Moses did? You mean I can experience some glory like His children had with him? You mean to tell me that I can have communion with him like that? That's why we're having revival. We're not having it to check off a list. Oh no. This is for you. We all with open face beholding us in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed the substitution. You say, well I'm doing pretty good. I don't think I need much change. Well you just revealed yourself. You probably need it worse than the rest of us. I need some of it. God's still changing me. Are changed into the same image finally, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit and the glory finally. The substitution in the glory and the Spirit and the glory. The Spirit. Who does this work? Listen to this. We all with open face beholding us in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image by the pastor. Nope are changed in the image by hill song music. Just turn that channel on and just stand there in the dark and shake and shimmer. Or just get you some singers, southern gospel, diesel sniffing, and get you, boy, that'll change you. That'll change you. Or changed by a preacher or a revivalist or a few days. No. What causes me to see the glory? Who reveals God's glory to me? I'll tell you who pulls the curtain back and points us to Jesus. His name is the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Are we creating a little bit of a taste thus far in this meeting? Because tomorrow night we're going to get serious. And a little more the next night. And then this meeting will be over. But by God's grace, the glory won't be over. Let's bow our heads together in prayer. Will you ask the Lord or will you tell Him, Lord, I want to be humble before you. Will you say that to Him? Will you say, Lord, will you humble me this week so I'll be real and so I'll be honest? Humble, Lord, I want to be humble before you. Will you, will you ask Him what Moses asked, Lord? Show me thy glory. Will you ask him that? Show me. And then we ask him this, Lord, show us. I love my church. I love my saints. I love my pastors. I, Lord, show us your glory. And then when you say, Lord, show them, outside of our church, would you help us to be able to, to a lost world, show them your glory. Lord, we, we are simple enough to believe that you meant what you said when you said we all with open face will behold as in a glass the glory of the Lord and will be changed 
We, we're going to unveil our face tomorrow night, Lord. We're going to be honest before you and humble. And then we're going to repent. And then, Lord, we are expecting a manifestation of your presence. And we'll just simply say, glory. Glory to God. From glory to glory. While our heads are bowed, I wonder if some of you, right where you are, or maybe you'd like to come and find a place in this altar. I'm not going to do a big, huge call to it because that's coming a little later in the meeting. But you need God's glory. You know it. You need to see Him. You need to be near Him. You felt maybe there's been a distance. Maybe you remember there was a day when you walked so close to Him. There was intimacy that you haven't felt in a while. As the glory is displayed, will you just come and ask Him? Lord, I need this week. I need you. Let's stand together with our heads bowed. And while they sing, come on. I see our leaders coming. I see others coming. Just come. Find a place in the altar. If you can't kneel, just stand. Or sit on the front benches just declaring, Lord, it's you that I want. It's you that I need, God. Come on. Just obey God from the balconies. From the back and the front, would you come? Granddaddy, would you come? Those kids need to see God's glory in you. Grandmother, mama, daddy, single adult. We're not going to lengthen this invitation, but there's some people in this room that won't experience the glory of God. I see it. We're hungry for it. Show it. Show me, Lord. Show us. to my children, God. But first, show yourself to me. Show yourself in these services, Lord. Breathe upon us, Lord. Oh, yes. Let me pray just a minute. Father, there's some people in this room that will not settle for just a little you and a little church and a little activity. Lord, I see it in their eyes and in their tears, many of them. And Lord, I put me in the group too. I don't want to live outside of the glory of God. Show me your glory. Show this church your glory. Show our community the glory of God. In these dark and confusing days, reveal yourself as never before in Jesus' name. While they sing one more verse, God spoken. Would you come? God bless you. Bring those children. Sing it. Let's worship together. Would you just obey God? Whatever He's saying to you. Maybe you're here and you're not saved. Come on, get right. Maybe you're saved, but you just want more. More of God. Something real. God bless you. You're important to God. He wants you to be near Him. As a hen gathers her young up, the, up next to her, that's what He wants to do with us this week. You're beautiful and you're important. You're valuable to God. He sent this meeting for you. Will you tell Him? Lord, I need you to take control. I took control again. I've done this before. Here's the reins back, Lord. I'm tired of this. Pastor, you come.
presence out of me. One of the things that I marvel about in the scriptures is when Jesus was going to the cross and he uh, was going to take the cup and he was facing the cross in the strength of the flesh like you and I. He was not going to use his deity. Man had to die for man. A perfect man had to die for man. God in the flesh was dying but it was not using God's strength but what what it made me, I, I can never get over this, is that, that he called on that Peter, James, and John to help him through it, to pray him through it, to help him. He come back three, could you not pray with him? Watch, couldn't you, one hour. He declared to him, he declared, your flesh is weak. You're spiritually okay, but you're, you're weak. And you know, I just can't help to think that we need to pray somebody through. Pray somebody through. Some of them are our kids. Some of our moms and dads. Some of us are our sisters and brothers. Some of us are our husbands and our wives. Um, one story, and we're done. And it's not as late as you think because we haven't adjusted that clock yet. Amen. So, my grandpa had just died, and Shuggy and I took our little kids at that time up to Michigan. Our grandpa. You know, got saved six years before he died. Uh, probably the man that influenced my life for the best, more than any other male in my life. I can't wait to introduce him to my kids. We met in, in Cindy's house in a little small home, and we got a bunch of us there now. So Kath is there and her family. I'm there. Cindy is there. So we got three of the four siblings that are there, and they're eating, and... and uh, there wasn't enough place to sit down, and the food was just on the table and sandwiches. And I said to one of my siblings, I said, man, somebody thank the Lord for this. And a voice came and said, you know, we used to do that, but we've gotten away. We don't do that anymore. And that would be okay if that's all I heard. But I heard something else. I heard something in my heart. I heard the Spirit of God say to me, but then you, you never prayed for your sister. You never prayed for Samuel. You never prayed for him. Never pray for them. And people are not going to make it unless you and I learn to pray for them. The Apostle Paul, 13 books of the New Testament, finally, brother, and he said, pray for us. Pray for us. And so if those great warriors, our Savior, needed someone, then how much you and I need someone to pray for us? So I'd, I'd ask you as we prepare, as we dismiss, please um, think about who that you need to pray for pray for and pray him through and help him. I can see this little girl. I can't, she's two years old. I didn't know she could get that. She felt that her older sister needed to address and hug her daddy. And she got behind, tied, and she was pushing her and saying, Daddy, Daddy, and she was looking at her. Daddy, and she was pushing, you know, a two-year-old pushing a four-year-old. Daddy, Daddy, she felt that her older sister needed to address her daddy in the morning. You know, and I see that's what revival is about. So who is it that you and I can say, you've got to see Daddy, you've got to come, you've got to be a part. And uh, please pray for our speaker. Please pray for God to visit us. Make every effort to make, be back with us tomorrow night. Amen. One, two, three, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It'll go so very quick. Thank you for seeking the Lord this morning. Seek him. What he has to say, seek him. Seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. So, amen. It's been good to be in God's house, hasn't it? Amen. 
If you see somebody you haven't seen and shook their hand, um, go get some of that germ scrub and put all over you and shake their hand and, and uh, greet someone. Let them know that you love them. If it's a Baptist bump or what it is, whatever it is, you make sure you love them. There's things in the bulletin. I don't even want to talk about them. I really don't. I just want to focus on revival. I just want God to visit us. That's all. I don't want to even talk about them. You know, well, they're yeah, I know they're important. But I don't want your mind to be, be distracted. A part of the meeting is a special time with the ladies at Tuesday at uh, 24 Exchange at 1130. It's a Dutch street, and uh, you're making your way. I don't know if you all got to sign up or not, but they have the room set aside. And uh, Mrs. Wagner is going to be speaking. That's the only thing we're going to talk about. Amen. Haven't you enjoyed the music of the day? Amen. That's the music, the song this morning, Brother Marion, Brother Jeff. Sing that again. Sing that again, Brother Jeff. Sing these songs again. We want him. Matt, thank you so much for that. Amen. Glad to be with you. Glad that you're here. I just want you to know I teased last week Brother Jim Wiseman about not kissing his wife, you remember? Because he didn't have his teeth. He got his teeth. And Carolyn told me this morning that he kissed her all day long. I love that's my kind of man. Amen. He broke late, and broke loose, and had his first McDonald hamburger today as well. Look at you can see he's already he's got a hold of her hand, ready to do it again. Lo, don't kiss her now, James. Oh, there he goes. He's starting. Oh man, oh man. Love you, brother James. Amen. So glad you're here. God bless you tonight. We love you. See you tomorrow night, seven o'clock.